Okay, so next episode of the Doratus Mind podcast uh, today, really, and I again, I, I think I say this every single podcast now that I'm always excited with the people that I get to speak to. I'm, I'm, I'm selective and able to select people, but today we've we've got uh, Langley, uh, former head of Army uh, Center of Leadership, uh, Lieutenant, former Lieutenant Colonel, now retired, um, MBE, no less, and. Um, really excited to where a conversation on on specifically the topic of leadership is going to go today. So welcome, Langley. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, I always get worried when people say retired at my age, but uh, yeah. Uh, uh, ne- well, tra- ne- transition transitioning sounds different as well. That's got various con- connotations. Different connotations, as well, yeah, yeah. Career transition, yeah. but um, but yeah. So um, former head of um, army leadership, like the burden of responsibility that comes with that uh, job role. Um, and you've recently distilled some of your thinking, Langley, into into a book. Uh, you sent it through last week. I've I've flew flown through it, like genuinely, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I think there's okay. gold in there for anyone uh, interested in this journey of leadership. Clearly, there's a it's heavily weighted from the military perspective, but like the burden of responsibility of even distilling the leadership down into a book. I googled it earlier. In 0.5 seconds, you get about five billion articles. So. Yeah. So talk to me. Um, well, firstly, just how how did the book come about? Uh, so it, I, I, the first thing I'll say about the books, my name's on the cover, um, but there's fingerprints of many on the inside. I often say that because like all things in life, and I'm sure most authors would say this, um, you know, it's always a team effort. And that book definitely was a team effort. So it was actually the brainchild of um, Professor Lloyd Clark, who's the director of research at the Cal, at the, the Centre for Armed Leadership. And um, he's worked there for five years. The, the, the Cal itself, the Centre has only been, uh, it was only set up in 2017. So it's a pretty new organisation. And there was a small team of us and we were charged effectively with doing the Army's thinking on on leadership or having that space to to engage with other people from different sectors, as well as clearly our, our own people across the organisation, to really understand what do we, what does leadership mean to us, where are we going in the future, where we come from, all that sort of business, and um, uh, and the team is charged with writing the doctrine, and we reviewed it and updated it uh, during my time there, which is which is a, a really good experience. And as we were doing that work, Lloyd said, well, actually, um, you know, you know yourself, Gaz, you know, doctrine is 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 a sort of conceptual framework of of thinking. It tells people. Um, how to think, not what to think, and it's and it's some broad principles um, about how we conduct our business. And so Lloyd said, "What wouldn't it be great to have a book that that dives deeper into what leadership means to the British Army?" Conscious that actually a lot of people look to the army and the military more broadly as a reference point for for leadership, right or wrong. Um, but um, so we thought, a uh, uh, great idea to have a book. So it will be, it will enable our own audience, people in serving people to better understand it and put it into context. But also wider that and almost with an um, altruistic focus, uh, an offer to wider society to say, well, this is how we do things and why, and this is our context. And these are some of the lessons we'd like to share with others. But in so doing, almost providing a platform dis- for discussion and debate so that we can learn off off other people. So it was Lloyd's uh, brainchild, as, uh, as I say. It took us about a year to pull it together. Um, I guess there was a slight uh, fortune in that COVID um, happened at the same time. I say fortune because you know, every crisis has got its opportunities and sure. that allowed us a bit of headspace to, to really... Um, uh, close the door and do some thinking and um unfortunately penguin um picked it up as a, our publishers which was fantastic to have them behind us and um and the rest yeah. is history very, and, very, uh, very yeah, grateful they did um yeah. i've i've I'm a, I'm an avid highlighter all the way through it there's a there's, <laughs> there's stacks of points up you know that's how I, uh, I i chew through things i learn i review but um it's, it's it's really good and i know our listeners i often get messages um frustrations from people's partners more often than not of how much we cost them but uh there's a lot of people listening that will no doubt dive into this because I'd, I'd recommend it for anyone in the leadership leadership game certainly you mentioned about how the army um or the military in a wider context is seen as having this greater understanding maybe or certainly a point of reference for mm-hmm. leadership um and there's so much i want to say around that but if, if can we if we if we may just rewind a little bit um just your story to getting to this place where you're the head the center of army leadership um and uh, how that journey's come about 
do you mind just cantering through that for us for a minute or yeah so? sure um i guess i fell into the army um I mean, it depends where you want me to start with uh, life-wise. Well, I'd always say I'd, I'd had a, I've had a privileged upbringing, and I mean that not in the sense of uh, money or wealth or what have you, but just in terms of very fortunate to have a, a loving, fo- a loving home. Mum, dad, are extremely supportive, and I think a lot of my uh, my characters as as, as as drawn from from them and what they they gave me is always into sport and the outdoors as a kid. Um, and an older brother who I always looked up to, even though. We fought like cats and dogs as kids, um, but I, I, I so I, I had an inkling that I might want to join the army. I don't come from a military background at all. My dad's a cleaner, uh, ran a cleaning company until about four months ago, uh, fifty-five years. My mum's a psychotherapist, and, and no one else in the family. But I'd always had an inkling and had an interest. And then I went to university in Sheffield, and I joined the officer training corps, which is a bit like uh, the reserves for students. And uh, I remember getting to the end of my first year there. And I've been away on a, 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 a first look, I think they called it, a weekend, the first weekend away when we dressed up in 58 pattern webbing, which you probably re- remember oh, sort right. of relics of World War II, a uh, hideous kit. And, um, and I just spent 48 hours cold and wet. And the, um, and the boss there said, you know, at the end of the year, Langley, you're coming back uh, next year. And I said, not a chance. I said, I don't understand this military lark. And, you know, how would anyone would want to do that as a career? And he said, well, c- come back in September after the summer camp and the adventure training package and um, and see how you feel. And I absolutely love those. And, and that was it. And the next few years, I, I, I carried on. But even when I finished university, um, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then a friend of mine was a reservist with the, with the parachute regiment. And uh, I, I tried the TA course, as it was then, Territorial Army uh, Commissioning course, and I failed. I was told I, I wasn't good enough. Um, so I that was a bit of a, a kickback. And uh, and then my mate said, uh, no, just go for the regular commission. You'll be fine. Something's happened on the day, whatever. Um, don't look back. Uh, go for it. So I, I did. And I, fortunately, I passed. I thought, well, who am I going to join? What regiment am I going to join? He said, well, you're going to join the parachute regiment. I've already booked you on a look at life two days with them. So um, I, I thought this is ridiculous. You know, just about scraped through the regular course, let alone join um, what everyone what many people consider one of the better regiments so anyway I, I did spend two days with them loved it they sponsored me through Sanders and fortunately when I went through the interview selection um, uh, they very kindly said yeah we'll give you a place and uh, and that was the start of my 23 years really with um, with the parachute regiment I served in all three battalions um, from a young platoon commander I guess it's similar to you guys we in many ways we were we were fortunate in, in when we joined just because there was so much going on in the in the late 90s when I joined. I joined 99, but in 2000s, um, it, within my first 18 months, I deployed to Northern Ireland, Macedonia and Afghanistan. And then clearly Iraq and Afghanistan dominated our careers thereafter. Um, so I, I, I was fortunate to get some real great experience, operational experience, which puts sort of theory into practice, if you like. And... Um, yeah, I'm kind of one of these people. I was, I was never wildly ambitious. I never wanted to be the next, you know, head of the army or anything like that. Uh, I just always looked at the next job and thought, where would I like to go? Where am I going to have the most fun, have the most value? And um, I think if you enjoy your job, it's you're going to give it 100 percent, and and the rest looks after itself. And I was just very fortunate to have the right opportunities, and uh, and sort of I went onwards and upwards. And and just before the Central Army leadership, I commanded one of the parachute battalions, which was. That and the company command before that was um, probably the highlights to my of my career and had a great time. Definitely, definitely yeah, going to scratch around that. Definitely going to scratch around that a little bit um, further into this. Just, just I, I want to just try and understand a couple of points. So again, it's it's fascinating to me at least. People probably less so listening, but we've got almost identical stories in many ways. Um, no military experience in our families. I've got an older sister, an older sibling. Mm-hmm. And just out of curiosity, how much older was your your bigger brother? So, so he was Spencer's two years older than me. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, my, my sister was three and a half years older than me, and arguably, you know, I was competitive as a child in sport and kind of dominating me in in, in most things we did. Uh, and that taught me a lot of how to lose and how to just mm-hmm. to go again. And I, I, certainly, I wonder. You said you fought like cats and dogs. And I wonder if again that. You know, being the younger sibling, it maybe taught you that, that you know you have to be a little bit more crafty to get to where you have to go. Yeah, quite than, possibly. Yeah, yeah. I think it also sort of, uh, uh, encouraged me to sort of take my own path. My parents are really good at saying, 
you know, you you decide what you want to do and we'll back you unless, you know, clearly it's dangerous or whatever. But they'd always say, you know, you push the boat and we'll be behind you on it. And, uh, and my brother and I, when we were growing up, we were poles apart um, in terms of personalities. He was, he's a real character. Um, he, you know, was often in trouble. Uh, didn't really get on with school or school didn't get on with him. Uh, but one of those, one of these kids, that everyone, everyone loved, but it was just, uh, uh, always wanted to do these things his own way. We wanted to be different. And, um, I, I looked up to him and admired him for that. And I was the straight guy. I sort of got on with it and, you know, I did my, did my own thing. I was probably the boring kid. And then I think we, he calmed down a bit in his late teens, early twenties. And I probably, you know, let, let loose a little bit more. And we met in the middle and we've, and we've been best friends wow. for, for life. But, our, story, um, our stories align even more. Um, <laughs> that, that, you, you, just, you just spoke my truth, but uh, but yeah. So, but also with that, you you mentioned um, you fell into the army, or more specifically, were pulled into the the parachute regiment, um, as I'm sure you know, former bootneck, and mm. definitely not wanting to get into that debate um, around the two organisations. I put them on the same page, certainly as the mm. lead recruiter into UKSF. Um, they were the rich talent pools that I was speaking to on a, mm. on a weekly basis. And the people in there were the people that I was most interested in. Um, you, you mentioned your, your caution or your fear, whatever it was. Again, I can speak about that from my perspective. I, I didn't expect to be successful in the Marines itself um, when, I, when I volunteered. But, you know, was it a simple case of uh, your friend who was saying, no, you are joining the parachute regiment? I mean, just just that that willingness to volunteer for something that you could see was arguably the most difficult challenge mm -hmm. again there's something in that for me is there, yeah. is there a sim have you ever thought about that um uh, no i haven't really but i guess i guess there's a there's there's always been something in me that is willing to give something a go willing to give that a you know willing to try and overcome a challenge but there's also i think I guess we've all got it to a greater or lesser extent that, that, that element of self self doubt. You know, am I good enough? Because, and again, guys, you would have experienced this throughout your career. No course or or no unit to get into is ever as hard as as you think it is before you actually do it. No matter how hard it is, there's always this perception. Not normally because you speak to the people that have come off the course, so you always get the bad side of it, right? Or people who have passed and they're in, you know, big it up. Um, so, uh, of course, it was, you know, and and your your background more so, but it was it was it was a, a you know, tough challenge and, and various hurdles and what have you to get over. But um, I guess initially I thought that's out of my reach, uh, but I was always willing to, uh, uh, you know, follow other people's advice that had been there and, um, and and give it a crack. And I guess every turn, you know, when people turn around and said, "Yeah, you've you've got it." what it takes for the next stage, whether it was sponsorship through Sanders or whether, you know, through the interview board at Sanders or P company after that. And, um, and then sort of every career stage after that, I think you just take one step at a time and, uh, and you, and you give it your best shot. If it doesn't work out, you, you, you recock and you go again and try you, something else. You do completely agree. Um, and, you know, social media world, it will throw out that, that, that statement of get comfortable being uncomfortable, which you just described. And we can, in hindsight kind of view each of those moments as a small step forward when mm. we're in the thick of it we it seems a lot more important or much more yeah. challenging I and mean, actually when we're in that uncomfortable position we hate it um yeah. at, you know but that p company is again i've not i've not been through that process again comparable with commando training i've got no doubt about that but just kind of just from a perspective of transformation mm. and you know I talk about a performance, uh, sorry, experience accelerator. And I imagine yeah. that um, P companies exactly that it certainly was in commando training, just that experience accelerator, just how okay. challenging for people listening were, were, were things on a day to day, weekly basis. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's, it was tough. Um, and I think you look back and think oh, I wasn't that bad after all, but when you're in the thick of it, it's, it's, it's pretty horrendous and it's supposed to be right. It's supposed to push you to your mental and physical uh, limits at, at, at that point in time and it, and it and it certainly did that for me but you know you're surrounded by quality people you've got that the urge that you don't want to fail you don't want to be that one and that they say no to at the end um um but um so yeah it it it, it was it was tough and, and I, I like your expression there of an experience accelerator because it's 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 often as commando course and others other courses you've done um it's a reference point isn't it you look back on 
And, you know, people talk a lot about resilience <clears throat> today and, and, and the military is very good at providing you those experiences that just take you out of your comfort zone, challenge you, take you out of your comfort zone and then build that bubble of comfort and, and, and experience so that when you're in some tough times, you look back and think, OK, well, I've done that. Or I've done that so I can cope with this now. Um, and I think it's about building those experiences and putting more and more pressure on. And P Company was definitely one of those defining moments in, in, in my career. When I look back and think, okay, yeah, that's a that's a, a significant hurdle I've overcome, and particularly certain events. Everyone talks about the stretcher race. You know, it's the infamous the infamous um, uh, event on P Company that everyone refers back to because it's just such pain. In, in, you could be the fittest man or woman alive. It's gonna it's gonna hurt from the first hundred meters. And I actually remember being a platoon commander at, at Catterick, uh, training our recruits about three years after I passed P Company. And of course, going back to my point, you forget what it was like and how hard it was. And the the Joes, the recruits, as, as we nicknamed them, and they were on the on the log and I was getting all excited to run alongside them and a couple of them fell off. And I was like, come on, Joe. And I jumped on the log, you know, all, all full of bravado. And within about 20 metres, I couldn't even speak. I couldn't even <laughs> breathe. <laughs> I was like, I now I remember what it was all about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you forget. You forget. You do, hindsight's a wonderful thing. And, and those rose-tinted glasses, for sure. But again, Again, we lean heavily into self-reflection and certainly personally reflecting and having those, um, getting it written down, it really helps you get context to that. When you look back, uh, again, I, I, I documented my career as I went through it in a personal journal, diary, not with any great detail, but uh, but just now it's it's almost, it's such a good thing to have because I've got those experiences yeah. um, documented. And because you say, we can look back and just, so easily forget again we could we could compare stories like that but, all the time and you know having gone back as an instructor on a number of courses where um you think you remember how hard it was and yeah. i can be running next to somebody not carrying the same weight and and judging them in some ways you yeah know, and, and yeah we've got to really be careful of that and again that comes back down to a, a number of leadership qualities i guess um but it's also appreciating that you know a good example of when you're when you're an extra instructor you may be five ten years older and you've had those other experiences that that have given you more physical and mental resilience so you're actually in a, a, a better place on the start line compared to you know an 18 17 18 year old young boys uh, as, as they were then uh, running along on, on a log for the first time you know it's a completely different mindset not not just physically but mentally and i love your i love your um your your discipline to write a journal i did uh twice in my career uh and I tried many more times after that to keep one. One, one during my time in Afghanistan, on, 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 on one tour, and then one towards the end of my career. And I really value that. And looking back at, at those diaries now, and I wish I'd done it for the rest of my career. My dad said it when I was growing up: "You must keep a diary." And I was like, "Yeah, whatever. I, I'm too busy." Yeah. Oh, gold, gold dust. You, and you also think there's just no chance of you forgetting this stuff. But I can. Yeah, keep, exactly. It's electronic now. It's it's all it's all in a document that I've got. Um, and you can read back and review it and you can think, actually, uh, there's no way I would have remembered that, you know, I just, yeah. because it has just been complete, thankfully it had been completely compartmentalized and to, to kind of try and forget it sometimes. But, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, uh, recommend anyone doing that again. It's, it's not a habit that I, um, uh, habitual on right now, but certainly with self-reflective practices, whenever I'm trying to kind of review something that's happened, then, then I certainly like to think in ink. It's something we, we work on a lot with our, with our clients as well, when, especially when they're facing various different challenges. Um, your career in the parachute regiment as a leader. And again, it's interesting to me that even that the, the relationship or the decision to to be an officer again just for your information you i hope you i'm sure you're unaware but i volunteered to be a royal marines officer initially went in and they said oh yeah gary or gaz you, you qualified you're also 18 um why don't mm. you go away get some life experience and they recommended sheep shearing um in australia <laughs> ironically i don't know what that would have provided me and they said go away sheep shearing get some life experience and come back in a year or two's time um and I was like, yeah, okay, sage advice. So left the room, thought about it for 10 minutes outside. And actually, I'm I'm really keen to go now. I was coming towards the end of my A-levels, keen to go now. And so just went back in and volunteered as an OR. You went into um, Sandhurst. And again, a lot of respect for Sandhurst. For those that don't know, it's uh, the Centre for Army Officer Development. Um, mm -hmm. And again, this talk about Experience Accelerator, um, just the 
the years and legacy that is involved yeah. in that place. I've been there presented a number of times and um, it's, it's super impressive. But again, that being in that environment, you know, we, we work with groups that talk about getting to different streams and tidal streams. And, you know, when you're in a, an environment like that, you know, you're where you started that transformation that you went through. Um, can you t- share a little bit about that? And again, thinking of the, the person listening that isn't going to get that experience, but maybe how they can join the dots with, what they can do, you know, because it's hard to replicate that model. Right? Sandes itself, are you talking about? Yeah. The, the experience of that? Yeah. Um, I, I, but I think, what would I say about that? I mean, I had a fantastic year at Sandes, um, one of the few times in your career when it's you, you only really have to worry about you. Of course, you've got your, your mates left and right of you, but you, you, you're not commanding anyone. Yeah. Um, you're not responsible for people's careers, people's lives and what have you. So um, <clears throat> it, it gives, there's plenty of time and scope to, to, um, to, to do well and to fail and you know try again and uh, uh, and it's a pretty in- intensive course um, unlike other militaries like our American uh, partners who do typically four years including a degree this is pure military training for for twelve months um, but it's uh, it's a great course takes you through the you know the, the, the basics of your profession through to commanding in, in various different um, uh, environments and then and then real sort of deep dive into leadership and, and, and officership towards the end so it's a really good uh, journey and and actually i think over over time you say there's a real legacy there i mean it's 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 been running for um uh, for hundreds of years and uh, and i think that depth of history and culture that's there is is, is all part of that inculcation of of, of 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 joining the army and joining something special and joining uh, a legacy that others have, have set before you um, and all that is, is important. We can perhaps talk about the importance of all that uh, going forward. But, um, I, you know, I had a really a good career, a good year there. I think one of the one of the real benefits that you have of that experience, um, you, your staff are both um, uh, senior NCOs and, um, and, and officers. You'll have a captain and a colour sergeant or staff sergeant that take you through training. And having that that um, that partnership leading you through that early part of your journey, I think is um, is really really beneficial, particularly the colour sergeants and staff sergeants. And I think that's quite unique to a number of armies that the, the the bulk of your training is delivered by by those seniors with real experience. The people that uh, you know very soon after you, you'll have under your command. Um, so that, I think I, I think I think that rich immersion. Uh, we're very fortunate in the in the military. In that we have time and space to get out and be trained and educated, and you know, if you're talking about leadership, there's many come. You know, most companies are they're on operations all all the time, whether you're public or private sector. They're doing what they're doing every single time, and it's very difficult for them to pause, to stop, and to take time out to do some education or do some training. But it's absolutely pivotal. So we're really fortunate with those foundations are set beforehand, and, and space is allowed for that because it is a force multiplier. There's no doubt about it. So such that when you arrive in your unit your battalion you know you've got that ground in and then the real work the real development begins uh through through daily experience yeah i'm pleased you said that so again for those not familiar you uh, was, was your first appointment a platoon commander with that yeah b yeah, company so, two para in Northern two para so you know daunting i'm i've no doubt but you you know for people to understand so uh typically a, a, a youngish man with some training can what well, cannonballed into a group of you know warriors in many ways and seasoned warriors no doubt and yeah. you know with the role of being in charge now that's yeah. the relationship where you're alongside a troop sergeant with a number of um talented corporals i'd like to hope um can yeah. you share that kind of you know when you're almost that managing up and managing down balance when you're you're new in the role i'm sure a lot of people can uh or listening can it, can can think of a time they've been maybe in a leadership position where they're new in role as well, and that's the challenges uh, and the th- the key things that help people cross that bridge. Yeah, it's a great question, and I've I've, I've I've reflected on a similar sort of question. I've talked about it in terms of followership, and I've talked about it in terms of the difference between command and leadership because it was absolutely stark to me. I only realised it in reflection years later, but it was very stark when I walked into. Um, into the room to meet my platoon for the first time. So that was, um, as I say, I joined B Company 2 Para, a five platoon B Company 2 Para on tour in Northern Ireland 
in 2001. Um, they'd already done four months of a six month tour. So I was joining for the last two months down in Fermanagh and, uh, and, uh, Stu, the guy I was taking over him said, right, let's go and meet the platoon. And I, and I walked into the room and it was a, it was a room about the size of your average classroom with 30 paratroopers that lived there for six months in this one room, triple bunk, uh, triple bunk beds, um, squashed in together. And, uh, I got introduced as the new platoon commander. And I remember staring across this room of, of, um, rather, um, um, yeah, sweaty, aggressive looking paratroopers in various states of dress. Some just come off patrol, some in, in their box of shorts or whatever they were, um, just got out of bed. And, uh, uh, and I remember this weight of judgment looking at me thinking, you yeah, know, who's the new guy? What's he going to be like? Is he going to look after us? Um, and it dawned on me then that that was the difference between command and leadership because command is as as we define it is the position of authority that is invested in someone in their in their their, their rank or the position what have you and the responsibility and accountability that comes with that whereas leadership is this and i'm sure we'll talk about this human element of being able to connect and influence people etc um and, and i thought this is it i'm actually commanding these people and i'm the least experienced in the room even the youngest private soldier has got four months on me of operational experience and my platoon sergeant, Mick Southall, was the youngest soldier to serve in the Falklands with uh, with three paras, 17 years old. And I think, you know, this is a room full of it. Going back to your point, that's in quality NCOs, great sergeant. Um, and uh, and all this experience is just staring at me thinking, what do you know? Um, so it, it was tough. It was it's a dawning experience when you think this is it. I'm, I'm in now. Um, mm, abs- the room's absolutely or literally stinking of experience. And, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. Honking, uh, as you'd say. It yeah, was, yeah. yeah. I'd, uh, I'll get that one in. But uh, how? so your job in that, and again, people can relate to this, your job as the, the new leader coming in mm-hmm. um, is to build trust yeah. and to build relationships. Um, yeah. You know, what have you learned the best ways to go about doing that um i mean i probably learned and relearned as we all we all have but i mean that's what leadership is all about right so social relationships that ability to connect with people and influence people in order to achieve an outcome and um uh i think you know you're absolutely right you nailed it there straight away it's all about trust if you don't have that trust we often say it's the glue that binds if you don't have that trust between you and the people you're leading or you, you, you know the people you're following um then then the relationship breaks down you can't achieve anything um how, how do you do that i think you just got to connect and the, the you know the first and foremost it's just about it's really simple things i mean we call it servant leadership about serving the, the needs of your people and looking after your people and knowing them etc and that's all absolutely uh you know, rock solid truth. Um, hence the motto of Royal Military Academy Sanders is serve the lead. Um, but what does that mean practically day to day? It's just the little things. It's just been speaking to people, speaking to them on their terms, asking them how they're doing, what's, you know, what's going on, what's happening today. How's the, how's the parents, how's the kids, how's the whatever, you know, it's just building those, it's those micro conversations and um, uh, actions every single day that, 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 that builds those relationships. And, and, and it doesn't take much for people to realize actually this man or woman cares about me. He gives a, you know, monkeys about what, 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 what you know, my, my role here. Um, I think that's first and foremost, there's lots more after that. There's, you know, the ability to communicate effectively. People will ultimately will look to you for your professional competence. There's no doubt about it. You can be the, you know, the friendliest guy or gal in the, in the room that everyone loves. <clears throat> We'd love to have at a party, but if you're no good at your job, um, you know, certainly on operations, there will be no trust there at all because you're ultimately responsible for for for, for their lives. So I think you've got to be you got to be professionally competent. <clears throat> um, I think humility is absolutely important. <clears throat> Going back to your point about, um, you know, there'll be a whole raft of experience, and throughout my career, no matter how senior I got, I was surrounded by talent, and I was surrounded by experience. And interestingly. And slightly off such, but the higher you go up in an organisation, as everyone knows, the breadth of knowledge you've got is 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 is, is you know, expands. But the depth of knowledge in certain areas, you know, you you're not going to be able to capture that because you're surrounded by specialists. So you've, that humility, I think, is absolutely critical um, to be able to 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 draw on the experience of other people, regardless of rank, you know, um, um, or or where they sit in the organisation. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's a whole mixture of things, being able to relate to people 
having that sort of emotional intelligence to 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 relate to them, and being good at your job, communicating well, and um, and 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 being professional. Great, great answers. As you progress through your career, um, and you've seen this breadth of talent, um, you know, you know, at no point again. The, <laughs> you know i feel blessed in some ways with my military career to have been in an environment where i've always been surrounded with incredibly competent mm. leaders to learn and develop myself mm. from was my hope um and i think what i'm trying to the, the question is really when you've when you've seen other people yourself well what what is it that they've had that you've gone, oh, I, I want to be, have you got a specific example of a somebody who you've looked at and gone, oh, uh, that man or woman has got attributes that, that that's that's what I want to be like as a leader? Um, uh, so no, no one person that stands out. I think I've been fortunate like you to have come across many great leaders and not so great leaders throughout my life, let alone career. And I think I learn, you learn different things off different people, right? But I, I think the qualities that really unite the people. So I'll name a few because it's always dangerous naming people because you'll forget others. And um, if anyone's listening, think, what about me? But James Martin um, is quite a senior officer in the British Army now. I know, I know. Colonel James Martin as he was, as he was when it, it was. Yeah, yeah. So and um, uh, General General James now. So um, you know, phenomenal leader was my boss previously um absolutely had your back bright capable understood the bigger bigger picture could relate the tactical action in, into that bigger picture uh, great decision making um he built a headquarters that 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 was absolutely supportive of me and my guys and girls and um gave us the freedom to deliver on what we needed to deliver uh, yet were there for support, held me accountable when when I needed to be, you know, just a and, and just strong morals and 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 the, going back to that point of communication, able to communicate with the youngest recruit all the way up to the prime minister, you, you know, um, really impressive individual. And there's a number of others uh, like him, uh, junior NCOs, senior NCOs, Corporal Scarrett, Sergeant Curry, this my my RSM, Den Starkey. You know, uh, and again, it's qualities of those individuals, utterly professional, moral courage, um, could, could communicate with the senior officer or the young, again, the youngest recruit and um, on, on equal on equal measure and, and individuals that everyone looked up to. There's also people uh, outside of the military. I mean, I, I boxed at um, Winco Bank uh, gym in, in Sheffield, Brendan Ingle, who's a world-class um, uh, boxing trainer, and anyone in the boxing world will, will know him. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, trained four world champions and many others. Um, and he was just a wonderful man who who wasn't just there to to teach boxing. He was there to, you know, give give young kids, no matter what their background, a step up in life. And he used to teach life skills there. They're not just boxing skills. And and I look back on people like him. They weren't in for, for the money or the fame. They they were in it because they loved their job. They loved their profession. And they genuinely cared about people. And I think those sort of tenants resonate across all great uh, mass- leaders. Massively, um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of respect for the, your examples. I know a few of the individuals. Um, what you've just touched on there, you, you mentioned with, with Brendan Ingle uh, specifically, but when in, in your role in various different command appointments, but then as the, the centre of army leadership, what? how do you sort of individualise people's development? You know, what's the... You know, clearly there's procedures, there's various different mm-hmm. training opportunities that can develop it with operational experience. But you kind of given some thought to individualizing people's development because, you know, we're all very different. I've got different needs. Is, is that something you've, you've given much consideration to previously? Um, I'm smiling because we spent over a year um, on a project called Project Bramall, which we managed to get Exco endorsement on and about £10 million of investment over 10 years. Um, a year later, I don't know where it's got to. I'm out of touch, but that's exactly what it was all about. And we we phrased it as the next stage of professionalising British Army leadership. And our premise was that you know, we've taught leaders and leadership um, for centuries, right? And we've professionalised it in the last few decades with our doctrine and our ever improving training and and, and ed- education. But our fear was that the net, not the fear. We 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 weren't personalising it enough. 
um, you know, people were getting educated, people were getting that education and knowledge put into context through training and, and people were um, taking lessons away for themselves from those experiences. And then of course, where you really learn, as I said earlier, is in the day-to-day in barracks and operations. But, but I think the army has, uh, and many other organizations are, are the same, um, can afford to do more in terms of personalizing that, which is what Bramall was really getting after. Um, now, it's very difficult to say, how do you have an individual pathway for 70,000 people? But there's lots of ways that we could and, uh, um, uh, improve that. You know, there is coaching coming in now, uh, uh, more so at our sort of senior level. Um, uh, there's psychometric testing, uh, personality testing, self-awareness tools that out there. That, that, that are starting to come in but i think it's also about joining joining the dots we were talking about you know if a young soldier joins up has a it does some psychometric testing some self-awareness uh re- reflection uh puts that into context in training and then g- goes back and then they're you know chain of command um s- specifically uh, uh, manage their development over a couple of years before their next career point and they go on to the to, to the next career stage a uh, career course and there's there's specific leadership evaluations that happen on there because a lot of our courses are still command focused they teach leadership and and of course you're expected to lead in certain training scenarios but i think there's more we can do to actually dive into the strengths and weaknesses of people's leadership specifically and then you can you can just slowly build up that evidence uh, over your career um and that allows your chain of command to to really target your own your own development but i think and it goes back to something you said earlier on and i've had a couple of conversations in the last week actually the real force multiplier in a lot of these things is is that reflective practice that ability to look back and how how many times have you gone throughout your career the sf are really the sf community are really really good at this they come off the ground i'm not talking about leadership now but more broadly they come off the ground and really robust after action reviews hot debriefs after action reviews focusing not on what we did right but what we did wrong um or you know how we can improve it for the next time and your elite sports teams there's many other good examples out there legacy james Coe, everyone knows that as a great example in there when new zealand just thrashed wales 40 42 7 and they come in and they just focus on where they could have done, done better for next time and um uh, but that 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 rigid focus on on self reflection, I think, will really take people to to the to the next level. Um, uh, hence, why sort of coaching is 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 taking a hold in and out of the military now, because yeah. I think you, you know if you if you're able to <clears throat> dig into a couple of layers below the surface, that's when you really learn. Yeah, I, cu- I couldn't agree more. And again, no one um, by definition <clears throat> was my coach. Um, or define mentor through my career, but there's lots of people that coached and mentored me through my career. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely see there being um, a position for that in the military. Um, lots of positions for those, whether they're external or internal uh, coaches, mentors, but then also within business. You know, I think that's a trick that most people, because it's almost it's it's that sense of vulnerability of well there's there's things to learn well yeah right there is things to learn five billion articles in 0.5 seconds right and yeah there's yeah. a lot to learn and why would you think as a leader in any given situation that you if it's complex that you've got the uh the the best answer well that's that's humility right out the window that you should even consider that i actually just with what you were saying i feel lucky towards the end of my career i was going to a lot of these command courses to to speak to the people on them as as a rich talent pool potentially of people that m- may be interested in a, a career in sf and um so the the you, captain's carders and the, the the majors carders at various different locations but then also uh it was, it was Brecon where we used to go mm. down to the, the junior Brecon and senior Brecon and speak yeah. to those boys along, alongside it in the Navy and the Marines as well. And um, I remember myself being on those courses. And, and at the time, we, in, in line with what you were just saying about that self-reflection, at the time, de- like, again, what we did in pool, we would send our guys um, out to back to the Marines or back to uh, Brecon if they were uh, Army cap badge to go and conduct this command course which at the time seemed like a, a, an epic waste of time because you didn't value that experience at the time yeah. now and again we came back more often than not with great results and we're yeah. able to compare ourselves some social proof against some quality people and yeah. see that we did all right we fared well and we came back with broader experiences 
often that we were very happy with where we were and we made the right career choices with regards to the, the, the sector we worked in. But um, we then kind of were able to lean on some of those experiences uh, because it was in a safe-ish training environment. And I look back now quite richly on those experiences because it did teach me an awful lot. And I actually had a conversation towards the end of my career with a good colleague, friend of mine. Uh, and he was saying, oh, we can go to Liverpool University and go get a get a degree in leadership if we yeah. you know, do this, that and the other. And I was like, do we really have to quantify our leadership acumen with a degree in it through a university in Liverpool? You know, and, and I was pretty unhumble about it. And then I reflected, walked away and thought, how much do I actually know about leadership if I wrote it down? Certainly a few years ago, not a book's worth of information. And uh, I was, you know, I was thinking, well, actually, there's a, there's an awful lot to learn because it's such a broad subject. And so, you know, I really value those learning experiences now. And again, wish at the time I'd have valued it probably a little bit more. The beauty of hindsight, that we, yeah, that we mentioned earlier. Um, and, I, and I think that bit about education is 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 really, really important. Uh, and often it's about making conscious what you already know. So the, the breadth of experience you would have had over your career, you could probably read that, that book or any other leadership book and think, yeah, I know this. But you may not, you may not, uh, it may be sitting there in the, in the subconscious because you haven't had that chance to reflect. And I think that's the beauty of a sort of wider education, just because it opens your eyes. I often say about leadership, um, and, and it goes back to your point right at the beginning about the, 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 the book is, is military focused, and it absolutely is. It's the British Army's perspective. Um, but, I, but I often give a talk about the fundamentals of the fundamentals endure. And um, uh, and the fundamentals, the context is very different, but the fundamentals are the same across every sector. And I don't think I've I often said, I don't think I've had a conversation in the last two or three years where I've been thinking about this and reading, you know, extensively and speaking to people from all different sectors. I don't think I've had one conversation where someone has said something fundamentally new about leadership to me. Um, it's all r- rather intuitive. What, but the beauty of it is, is it, it, it brings it into your consciousness and, and a bit like re- self-reflection. If it's in your consciousness, then you could be better for it because you're going to be more deliberate. More. And, 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 and you have introduced some new thinking from your book. There's not everything in there. wasn't the case. I've heard this before at all. But like I, I forget who said it. It's that quote, uh, people need to be reminded more than they need Definitely. to be told. Yeah. And just being yeah. bringing it into your conscience again, it, absolute vital skill. And whether that's, fresh ideas, fresh stories. And again, um, big thing that I'm leaning into now with with our groups is just having a really rich story to tell a lesson or to teach yeah. something. In my old world, in training environment, it would off, any lesson would be preceded with a story of where to give it context. And again, yeah. we were lucky with having those experiences. And I know now why that's so with how the mind works. Um, we've, we've used great storytellers but no one wants to be the storyteller in our old organizations yeah. because that's got various connotations and yeah, you don't want to be that person, but yeah. it's, uh, it's, it, it's doing it the right way and again, making it about us and we rather than about I, yeah. um, your own personal experience, not to put you on the spot, but, uh, kind of the worst leadership experience or example that, that you learned from that. Do you have uh, any sort of examples or stories around that? Um, I don't know about experience, I say experience in terms of individuals and going back to your point about, you know, who are the best leader or leaders you've yeah. learned from. I think in the same way I've probably learned as much, if not more from those that weren't good leaders. Of course. Um, in the same way you, you learn more from failure than success. Right. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely not going to name names here, but as a platoon commander, as a captain, I worked for, I worked for a number of different majors over the years, but there were a couple that, that, that spring to mind that, have very sort of similar qualities in terms of their poor leadership. In fact, I look back and don't think they were leading at all. They were commanding, you know, they would live in their rank and they would, they would talk to you and they would talk to those b- below them in a very different way to those above them. And, um, and, and, and it goes back to your point about trust and they weren't particularly professionally competent and they often make poor decisions or didn't communicate them effectively. Um, and, and, and all of that could be seen through. And so there was no trust, there was no respect there, and uh, and that and that was really difficult when you've got people like that in your and, and many people have had similar experiences in different organisations with the line managers and what have you, and how you how you deal with um, individuals like that. But I think I think you the, the the beauty or the advantage of those experiences, you think okay, that's that's something I absolutely need to avoid. 
you know that I can see the effect that that individual is having on on me, on my 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 mates, my colleagues, and the the organisation more broadly, the climate that they're they're setting. And I uh, think those are ironically uh, valuable experiences. Couldn't, couldn't couldn't agree more. The uh, I always think back. You know, we are you know by our very design wired to recognise bs right we, yeah, yeah. And, and because oh, it's, it's potential thre- <laughs> exactly potential <laughs> threat to our security and so and that lack of authenticity of yeah, somebody yeah. stood there that's in some ways sometimes presenting a facade to protect themselves or their own lack of willingness to express some vulnerability and, and make it sound too complicated but just to stand there and put a front on to kind of say well I, i've got the answer here well be scratching around that that's probably unlikely and actually it's born from fear of judgment in many ways definitely and, you know we can we, we can learn from that so much but it's hard though right it's hard to really be vulnerable in a leadership position when you got this group of people around you again certainly my experiences are that the times that you are honest about that just builds trust rather than presenting a facade absolutely people can just we're hardwired to see it right absolutely and as and there's always a balance as you as you know you know you you can't be too vulnerable all the time there's a place to be vulnerable a place to not but absolutely um because if you're not then there's um uh, I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of those individuals, and there's one other who is more senior and and v- I, I go as far to say the the, the toxic word. Um, the, I think they lacked they lacked inner self confidence, um, and um, and and this front was there to protect them. Uh, absolutely, I often say I, I hate giving lists of you know leadership qualities. What makes a great leader? And, you know, it's always dangerous going down lists and what have you and attributes but there's one that always stands out and i guess it goes back to your question about the, you know the qualities that the, the same across all work leaders i've come across is, is is self-assuredness and it's that inner self-assurance i may have already said this excuse me if i repeat myself yeah. but it's that inner self-assuredness and it's not it's not um necessarily it, of course it comes out in, in an element of confidence certainly not overconfidence and arrogance which is i, I detest um but it's it's that uh, self-assuredness inside to be confident about making decisions, about confident in uh, taking risk. It's about confident in letting contr- tr- letting your your um, control go and empowering other people's this con- uh, self-confidence and assuredness in in having humility and knowing that other people are better than you and have more experience than you, regardless of what rank they're. All the stuff we've spoken about, um, I think, such a strong quality. Uh, and I think that's I that's the one that really stands out for me. I agree, and a lot of that comes down to um, when when you're saying that that self assurance, you know, born from making the right decisions based on what you know at the time, i.e., moral courage yeah. to say, yeah. I, I believe this is the right thing to do. Now, yeah. you've always got to live with those decisions. I'm sure you've got experiences. I know I certainly have where I can hand on my heart say at the time I thought I was making the best decision for the group myself. Um, and, and and I stand by that to this day um, and and that therefore we can deal with that. And I think leaders would struggle if they ask themselves that question and say, I, I was, I was maybe thinking a bit selfishly or actually on reflection, that, that probably wasn't the right call uh, based on yeah. the things I did know at the time. If I'd have just taken a bit of a, what we'd call a Hamlet moment. Old yeah. School. The Condor moment. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And it's also appreciating. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, uh, in fact, I, there, there was um, uh, a lady I was having a conversation with the other day. She made a decision. I won't go into these. She made a decision, and then um, and she said she was worrying about it all night. Uh, all night, and she phoned up the next morning. And she said, "I'm going to have to revert my decision. I'm sorry, um, but I I didn't take, as we would call it, that Hamlet, that Condor moment when when perhaps I I should have. And I really respected her from that because she could have just let it go, but there would be wider implications in terms of the perception of of, of her not being true to herself and true to to the rules and regulations, or whatever it may be, that others others would then look at her." Um, uh, as a result and um and i thought you know that you you had moral courage to to do what you did there and, and i thought that was um that was great there's, there's also Go on. i was just going to say you can only you can only you can only um make a decision and then accept the feedback or the action the action gives afford to feedback and then you can adjust test and adjust and and so like the u-turn based on new information that's so much stronger than just plowing on regardless absolutely right? Absolutely. And again, this, you know, it's a balance of, yeah, I mean, this is the classic U-turn. This is all over the news at the moment, isn't it? But, um, you know, I, dare I say, I think yeah, that's one area as well, our, our political 
um, answers would, would would learn a good lesson, and I, and I get why they don't because it's it's literally so political and and divisive as a as a as a as a culture, um, and unfortunately the media and other political parties jump on that as a negative. But you're absolutely right. If 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 you make a decision and on reflection or with trusted people around you saying actually you made the wrong one, there having the humility to turn around and say, "Yep, got it. This is why I made a decision, but I'm going to change it, and this is why. Let's move forward positively." Um, and not wait till you have to be forced to make that decision, um, uh, to, you know, too far down the line, then uh, th th that's got to serve to your strength. And, and, and again, going back to your point, en enhance trust at the end of the day, really, really important. Absolutely. Um, I'm super conscious of time. Uh, there's a few questions I really want to unpick. You've, you've lived a, a busy career. You're a, you're a husband, a father, um, Balancing intense career with family life. Uh, we touched on it briefly before we started recording. I wish I'd already started recording. But uh, there's a lot of people that in the exact world that I speak to that wrestle with that. Um, mm. In a, only a minute or two, what, what have you learned, Langley, in that space that have really uh, helped you keep balance um, on the whole? Uh, you can ask my wife whether I've actually kept it. Um, I, I definitely haven't kept the balance at times. Um, I think there are times when, so long if you set the conditions where you are, if your focus is going to be work, um, if you set the conditions, then then you're in a good place. So when I was uh, one of my tours in Afghanistan, again six seven months, my wife was absolutely brilliant. She said, right, this is your time. Go to it. I've got I've got the family, and she set herself up a, a home uh, with the kids. Went to live with her mum. Uh, and the conditions were set, allow me to focus on what I had to do. Same when I was a commanding officer. Uh, she said, these are your two and a half years. I've, I've got it. And she's an absolute rock. She's a legend. And uh, and it enabled me to focus. And there are other times, in fact, when I was at the Centre of Army Leadership, COVID kick, kicked in. We were doing the book. We were helping the NHS, doing lots of other work. And we, we, we had a great team and really enthused by what we were doing but i just i just did too much my wife is saying well you just finished command this is supposed to be some balance now and you're still here at 12 o'clock at night or whatever it was doing work um so i i think you've got to be really conscious of, of when you focus on work and, where, and when you don't and i think one of the one of the real advantages and i i'm as you say i'm now recently left the army and that was a family decision um, and it was in order to settle the kids for, for school uh, i left on a high still love the organization um, but but I, I reached the point where I thought, no, I've got to give back. And um, unfortunately, I've, I've now managed to get that and still doing very enjoyable work, but but getting that balance with the family. You've, yeah. Yeah, it's critical. And, and, again, life, life has chapters. Again, we're, we've, we've got a similar story with regards to that. You know, my, my decisions were formed on very similar reasoning and uh, conscious of missing out way too much and also not supporting um, them in the way that I wanted to do as a, as a father and a leader of yeah. the, my family. Right. And so it was important to me to, to have, make that decision as well, a tough decision that it was. And, um, we won't dig around how that's going, managing business and also keeping balance, right. It's a, it's a challenge in itself. It is a challenge. Yeah. It is a challenge yeah. for sure. Um, but with that in mind, like how, how does Langley unwind? What does, what does relax and recover and reset look like for, for yourself? Ironically, and myself and my wife are the, are the same. Our, our, our unwind is not necessarily relaxing; it's exercise, as we were speaking about before. Um, that's my release valve. That's Heather's relief valve. Release valve. Um, when you're stressed, when you're you know, burnt out, whatever it may be, just go for a run, go to the gym, rounds of the bag, whatever it may be. Uh, other than that, genuine relaxing, I'm afraid, it includes a bottle of wine um, or a couple of glasses at least, uh, and, and just be able to sort of detox and sit in front of the tv or spend time with the family in fact one other is um we just got some pigs in so spending time gonna, <laughs> gonna feed the pigs is uh real mindfulness as they say yeah. nowadays yeah like so i love it each of their own for some people it's choir for some people it's riding a horse and absolutely feed the pigs um yeah, I love it. <laughs> um last question and we always like to leave uh people with a, a kind of um from gems himself aside from the book which all good bookstores the habit of excellence um that i've mentioned already you know any any books or podcasts that you'd um you'd steer our listeners to i i would definitely steer you to a book i'm trying to find it on my bookshelf now man's search for meaning oh. man's search for meaning victor frankel yeah. Um, I, I mean your reaction says it all probably the most compelling book i've ever read I've read it several times i often refer to it 
um, a remarkable story, um, all about freedom and responsibility from a man who lost his, in the most horrific of circumstances, as a, uh, um, a, a prisoner of war in Auschwitz and Dachau and many other concentration camps. And I mean, his story and his reflection on how he survived is just utterly remarkable. Um, yeah, that's that's the go-to book. Yeah, our, our listeners are familiar with that, and I've banged on a number Great. of times. But but I mean, we we, we almost Absolute need jam. to hammer that point home. It needs yeah. to be read and understood. Um, we talk about context. Our backgrounds afford us some context and perspective, like like completely submit to the experiences that Victor experienced and kind mm-hmm. of learned from with regards to resilience and perspectives. You know, you, you know, you mentioned it there. It's, it's a fascinating book. I'm so pleased it got it got written, and because of the oh, decisions well. that were happening on a daily basis during that time, it very nearly didn't. Um, so no, it's it's an amazing book. Um, there, yeah. the, there is one other uh, guess if you want a, a fresh one. It's Ordinary Men and uh, Christopher uh, Brown, and I think his name is Ordinary Men, and it's about the similar sort of uh, period and issue actually. And it's about um, a police battalion in in Poland who were charged with um, rounding up um, and, and in some instances killing um, uh, Jewish people as part of the uh, Holocaust, and just the psychology of of the different people that were involved in that why they did on mass why they did what they did and um in terms of understanding human psychology uh, it's a fascinating book uh, again a disturbing read but but really insightful and and, imp- oh, and important lessons we must learn thanks no that's really useful langley i appreciate that um where can people find you my friend um steer them towards your things um more than happy with that Great. Uh, well, you've already mentioned the book, which is very kind of you. The paperback's out on the 3rd of November, uh, hardback. I think some copies still are available on Amazon. Uh, on my website, uh, frontierleadership.co.uk, uh, or I'm on LinkedIn. be great to hook up with people. Yeah, for sure. And uh, as we were saying before, I, I, we're moving in similar circles. Um, I welcome any collaboration or stuff we can do together. If Likewise. our paths cross, then I look forward to a coffee or a pint, a glass of wine. Or bottle. Glass, of wine, glass of wine and a walk with the pigs. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for your time, Langley. Brilliant. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Much appreciated.